Good morning, church. So glad that you joined us this morning. Whether you're here in person or you're joining through our online campus, we're so glad you're here. Now, you probably remember from last week, if you were here, that we're continuing a series that Pastor Doug started entitled Good Grief. We just saw the bumper for it. We're learning how to share our grief and sorrow in the proper way way, what we call lamenting. So this feels kind of awkward for some of us because many of us grew up in families and households where we didn't complain. Or maybe what you've understood of the scriptures over the years is that I thought we weren't supposed to complain. Didn't God punish the ancient Israelites for 40 years in the desert because they were complaining? Well, the point is, is there's a way to complain and bring our requests, our hurts, our pains to God. And the Bible gives us a pathway for how to do that that uh, will lead to increased trust in God. And we looked at last week this idea of complaint, that actually God encourages, invites us to complain to Him. That's pretty awesome if you think about it for just a second. God wants that. He invites that kind of pain. And the Psalms are this honest place to do this. I love this quote by Eugene Peterson. It says this, We need to learn to cuss without cussing. Isn't that true? Like, we need to find expression for our complaints, our hurts, our pains, our hang-ups, all of that stuff. We need to learn to cuss without cussing. The Psalms of Lament are honest expressions to God of our hurt, our disappointment, our pain. They're a form of cussing, a holy form of cussing. Not cussing, but something different. But they are nothing but honest You know, the action item from last week from Pastor Doug was to actually write a lament of your own. How many of you had a chance to do that this past week? You took some time, wrote it down. There's not going to be a test. You're not graded on this, so it's okay. You took some time to write down maybe some of the disappointments or complaints that you had with God. He gave us a proper form for that. And he kind of teased us a little bit because he said he had actually written his own psalm of lament. And he even suggested that some of you might have been included in that psalm of lament. Well, it just so happens that I have a copy of that lament right here for all of you. Should I read it, Pastor Doug? Yeah, you see all the things in in red there? Uh, Crazy. And I thought we were supposed to share, not scare, with our honesty. I'm kidding. Love uh, love the act of of honesty and just crying out to God and saying, God, what, what is going on in my life, in my world? So, in the laments, we we have this this incredible picture of how to talk to God. Now, I want to say this. The Bible we talk about is God's words to us. The Psalms are also God's words to us, but the Psalms, specifically the Psalms of lament, are our words to God. And we see this honest expression in our crying out before the Lord. So, the Psalms are a way of cussing without cussing. And a third of the psalms, as Pastor Doug talked about last week, are committed to psalms of lament, of crying out to God. They're honest expressions of our grief, sorrow, frustration, and they're important to God healing uh, us in our lives. So we looked at a couple of different aspects of the psalms. First of all, that lament is a prayer of pain that leads to trust. There's going to be an arc, a momentum, a direction of the Psalms of Lament that actually take us somewhere. Lament, secondarily, is the space between our brokenness and God's mercy. And lament, lastly, is the path from heartbreak to hope. Lament is not, it's not wallowing in our self-pity. It's not reliving our, our trauma or pain again and again, over and over and we just can't move on. It's, uh, it's more than just expressing that. Lament gives us a way to talk to God about our pain, to cuss without cussing. And it's a divinely given invitation for us this morning to pour out our hearts, our fears, our frustrations, our sorrows for the purpose of helping us renew our confidence in God and His goodness. I love this quote from J. Todd Billings. It says this, Rather than being one-dimensional, our affections need to become agile and multidimensional through being reshaped by God through the Psalms. The Psalms give us a way to pray in many keys, major and minor, while directing us to the source of the one true hope, the Lord and His promises. 
Some of us are in that place where life is in the minor key right now, or maybe it's a major key. Maybe this is not a season for you of lamenting. Maybe it's an encouraging time, but whatever the note of your life right now, we have space to cry out to God, to complain, to cuss without cussing. The direction of these psalms, really, they lead us to praise, they lead us to trust, they lead us to hope, but ultimately, they lead us to God. And throughout the psalms, we're given this beautiful uh, threefold overlapping movement And it's in the form of a complaint, again, which is what we talked about last week, cussing, complaining, crying out to God, expressing our grief, our sorrow, our disappointments. But then there's the asking, the petitioning of God, asking for God to take us out of this circumstance or situation that we're in. And then lastly, praise. We walk away with a renewed sense of trust and praise and ultimately worship of God. So last week we looked at the first movement of the complaint, and this week we're going to look at the ask. So turn in your Bibles, or your computers, or your phones, or whatever you might have, and we're going to to look at this psalm again. This is going to be Psalm 13, and we're going to look at all six verses. Um, Let me lament for just a moment here, as I have to now wear these. Anybody have readers now? Only when I wear contacts. Second law of thermodynamics, entropy, everything's falling apart. But hear the word of God this morning. This is Psalm 13, starting with verse 1. Get the tenor and the emotion behind this. It's so good. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day, have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me. And answer me, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for this space this morning to be a place of honesty, of expression. Lord, to cry out like the psalmist, how long? Lord, I know my friends here are going through a lot in life. So, Lord, I pray that we would have the freedom, the honesty before you and before each other this morning to talk about those hurts and pains where they're past or present. God, would our lives, would the note of our lives end on this high note And would our study through the the laments, Lord, through the pain, lead us ultimately to a place of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, we looked at at the complaint last week, but a couple things I want to say about this, because the psalmist seems to be alone in his suffering, which is significant. When we think about the trouble that we go through in life, it's hard enough to go through difficult things, but when we're in isolation from other people, It just makes it so much more worse and and even intolerable in many ways when we're alone. And for the psalmist in this context, it's not just that he's alone, but he seems to be surrounded by people, but the very people he's surrounded by are enemies. So it starts off on this really kind of hard note of, how long, Lord? I feel alone and the people around me are seeking to crush me and hurt me. And it feels as if God is hiding his face. From the psalmist. This could be a consequence of sin. Uh, maybe he's in a timeout. Maybe God set him aside and he's doing some work in this person's life, David in this case. Or maybe it's just the consequence of living in a broken and bent world. Whatever it might be, the psalmist feels alone. But then he says in verses 3 and 4, look on me and answer me. Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death, and my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Look on me and answer me. This idea of look is God's favor, his expressed favor in our life. He's saying, Lord, return your favor into my life. Enter back into my life. I need your blessing. I need your presence. I need all of that. Literally, Father, look at me. 
A number of years ago, my daughter Chloe, who's now 21 years of age, she was probably about three or four at the time. And like most younger parents, I was kind of sidetracked a little bit. I was distracted. My daughter was trying to have a conversation with me. And she kept saying, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And I was like, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Finally, she had enough of it. She grabbed my face and she moved my face towards her and she said, Daddy, look at me. Look at me, Daddy. And I realized it was important to her at that moment. And I dropped everything that I did and I listened to her. My little baby girl, she's so cute. I was going to show you a picture just to play with your emotions this morning and that was just low-hanging fruit. So I didn't do that. But this cute little girl, this little three-year-old, Daddy, look at me. And I turned my face to her and looked into her eyes. Now, I don't remember what I did in that situation, if I actually solved the problem that she was crying out to me, or if she just wanted to share what was going on, something maybe that she was even excited about. It might have been something she was struggling with, but she was saying, Dad, look at me. And that's what the psalmist is saying in this passage. He's saying, look at me, Daddy. Return your favor. Pay attention to me. I'm going through pain and hurt and difficulty. And there's nothing else that can satisfy. There's no one else. I need my Father. I need my God, my King. Daddy, look at me. You know, the difference between earthly fathers and our heavenly Father is He's always willing to look at us. He's never distracted. He's never about something more important. He's readily available, and He wants to hear our cries Daddy, look at me. I love how the psalmist in this passage cries out to God. First of all, he addresses God as as Lord. Now, you you know in the Scriptures when you see the word Lord in caps that it's what we refer to as the tetragrammaton, which is a really big word. And it's really the divine name Yahweh. And many of the ancient writers wouldn't actually include the name Yahweh in the written word because it it was too holy. So they would put this replacement of Lord. So notice the reverence and the relationship that the psalmist is writing. He says, Lord, my God. Not just any God. You are God. You are holy. You are completely other. You were set apart, but you are also near and imminent and in relationship with me. You are my God. Daddy, look at me. Moms and dads, just a quick side note here for us to think about. There, there's probably no greater gift than you can give your children right now than a gift of your presence. You might be like I was those many years ago and still even struggle today where I'm just about other things and my kids might want to be a part of my life and enter in a conversation. You might have other things that seem more pressing or more urgent, but you are the single, alongside God, the single greatest influence in the life of your kids. So give them the gift of your presence. When I think about my relationship with the Lord, it's often not a feeling that He's distracted, but often, more often, that I'm distracted. Anybody relate to that? I I just there's so much going on in life sometimes. And when it comes to my relationship, I just I hate to admit this, but sometimes when I go through difficult things, I might have the tendency to run to other things rather than to turn to God. I think many of us that's probably true of our lives, and we hate to admit it, but it's but it's true. We're, we're more likely to turn to things. We might, we might try to control our conversations with people rather than honesty in our relationships and our conversations with other people. Try to kind of keep it down and keep it at a low level and control talking about things that might be too difficult to talk about. Maybe we try to control the people around us if we're going through a difficult situation. Maybe it's running from some form of medication, work. It might be leisure, the bottle, the joint. The pill, the refrigerator, snap, I just said it. (laughs) We might run to Amazon, social media, the news station, your man cave, your she shed. Any ladies have a she shed yet? No? You even know what that is? You need one. Let's just say that. You need one. There, there's, the problem with, with us is just there are, there are times in our lives when we just get distracted and the things that we turn to, they don't deliver anymore and our options are out. And it's often in those weak moments that we really reach out to God. 
And it might even be some of those things in our life that are causing some of the distractions and pain in our life as well. And God wants us to put those things aside and to return to Him. The psalmist is out of options. He says, Daddy, look at me. He knows that only God can return, return that favor and, and, and that attention that He needs. And He says this, give light to my eyes. Give light to my eyes. We know that if any of us have been through something traumatizing in our lives, that you can often see it in a person's face, specifically their eyes. Maybe it's even more heightened now because we're all wearing masks and all you see is eyes, right? So you can look at somebody and just know how their day's been just according to their eyes. I had a couple of friends this week that I bumped into that I haven't seen for, for many years. In one case, 25 years, and another probably 15, 20 years. It had been a lot of life that had been lived apart from each other, and I saw the pain and the loss in their eyes, and life had not been great to them. They'd been hurt. They'd been bent. They'd been bruised by the world. So the psalmist says, Lord, return that sparkle in my eye. Give me that spring in my step. There's a sense of feeling crushed, and God, put that, put that light back in my eye. He said, or I will sleep in death. Now, it could be that he's talking about literal death. Again, he's got these people who are seeking his life that want to kill him. Or it could be metaphorical for depression or sadness or grief or sorrow. And many of you have at times, and maybe even now, been in a place of deep sadness or sorrow, and you can't distinguish the difference between depression or death. Because you felt the crippling weight of that in your life. And David, the psalmist, says, Lord, return the light into my eyes. Return your favor. Turn and look on me. Don't forget me. And then he says this in verses 5 and 6, which Pastor Doug's going to get a chance to talk about a little bit more next week. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. I told you the Psalms of Lament would end on a note of hope. But for us today, we're in this kind of pregnant moment where we're living in between the complaint in the praise, and sandwiched in between these two realities or this petition or this ask of God, change my condition, change what's going on in my life so that I could have light returned to my eyes. I could no longer experience the fear of death, but really live the life that's truly the life. I'm going to say it this way this morning. Petition is God's gift to us in between our problem and His provision. Petition, praying, asking, prayer, requesting things of God. It's our gift from God in between that problem and His provision. Nothing's been solved yet in this psalm. Do you see that? There's not a nice, tidy ending. It ends, it ends on a high note of trust and praise, but nothing's been solved. But in the midst of that, we have this gift of prayer and conversation with God. Petition is God's gift to us in between the problem in His provision. No matter what the cause of suffering, church, in our lives this morning, internal, external, circumstantial, self-inflicted, we can cry out, Lord, listen to me, and He will turn His face, and He will answer. We can approach the Lord and Father and say, Daddy, Daddy, look at me. Look at me. Father's always waiting to listen. He's never bothered. He's always looking on us. Isn't that a, just an incredible thought? That would be enough this morning if we just ended there and wrapped it up. Some of you are probably hoping we would. Sorry to disappoint you. We've got more. And wait, there's more. Because there's a lot more. We've talked about how about a third of the Psalms are considered Psalms of lament, but it's also interesting that most of the psalms that Jesus quoted in the New Testament were the psalms of lament. He identified with these in his life 
and ministry. And really, I would argue that we really can't understand the Psalms until we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, because that's where they find their context and their meaning and their appropriation. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 22, starting with verse 39. This is Luke's gospel, and it's the account of the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is what Luke records for us. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and His disciples followed Him. On reaching the place, He said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And then look at verse 43. I've often overlooked this verse when I read this passage. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Jesus' petition to God is that he would take this cup of suffering away, but ultimately he rested in the will of God for his life. It's kind of a crazy way to think about this, this submission that we see in the Godhead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living in community with each other in this mutual submission where Jesus won't do anything that's contrary to the will of God the Father or God the Spirit. So he humbles himself in this moment. And receives the will of God, knowing what it would mean for all of humanity. And he cries out, the lament is, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. After the angel appears to him and strengthens him, it's it's a sign of what God does for us oftentimes. In between that problem and that provision... We have God's presence. We have His care in our lives, His love. He never withdraws that from us. Even if we feel as if He does, He's still there and present with us. So Jesus, even in this this passage, He's crying out, He's petitioning God. Petition is God's gift to us in between the problem and His provision. Petition, prayer, conversation, relationship with God. I remember a couple of years ago, I had uh, ended up at our, our last church, which was in southeast Wisconsin, right in between Madison and Milwaukee. And God called us there. I was a 36-year-old pastor and thought I had something to bring to the church. The church had recently gone through a church split. So the church had been around for about 25 years, and the founding pastor of that church left. It was just an incredibly painful season in the life of that church. I came into that context as a 36-year-old pastor, first time I had led a church, experiencing the pain and the hurt that the community had gone through. Half the church had gone to another church across town. That pastor had actually pastored a church five minutes away after he left that church. The church was upside down financially. We had a huge facility, 33 acres. We were upside down in debt. And I honestly thought I could come in and bring something to that community. <laughs> Looking back now, it's kind of comical. It's like, what, what could I do in this situation? But I was pretty eager, and I remember telling our leadership at the church, you know, it's probably going to take three to five years to turn the church around. It's going to take a lot of hard work. We're going to have to roll up our sleeves together and lock arms, and I'm confident God's going to do some things together. And things started going south. So 18 months into my time there, there was just incredible just tension and pain that I was having with a number of people in the church. might be hard for some of you to kind of experience the underbelly of the church, right? We often get to see the really great things. But in this moment, it was a really hard, painful experience for me. The hardest thing was that there were certain people in my life, like the psalmist, that felt like enemies to me, that they were just bent at destroying me or undermining me or causing me harm personally. And I prayed a prayer. My prayer was twofold. Lord, either take these people out of my life. You're probably thinking, bad pastor. We're being honest this morning, right? Told you we're going to be honest. Lord, either take these people out of my life. I don't mean take them out, Lord. Like, you know, just (laughs) remove them from my life. Bless them with another life. That was the first prayer. And the second prayer was, or make me stronger. 
And God did both. It was a really great experience for me. So God just decided to extract some of those people out of that church and out of that community, who, by the way, might have been praying the same prayer about me. (laughs) God, take this man out of the church or remove me. It ended up working out well for everyone. Again, these were dear brothers and sisters, but sometimes we just are at odds, and it was a painful, painful memory. But the biggest thing for me was the strengthening that took place in that. It wasn't the removal of those people in my life. It was the process that God took me through. The strengthening Spiritually, I became a better pastor through that time. I became a better father, a better husband, a better neighbor. God used that pain redemptively in my life. So when I read this this passage about Jesus, I can kind of, I can relate to an extent, not to the point and extent of what Jesus experienced and the weight, the crushing weight of our sin on his shoulders. But we might feel that way sometimes. God, My will would be for this to happen, but not my will be done, your will be done. So how do we how do we petition our Father? And I want to look at another passage here in Luke chapter 11. This is such a great, great section here. So we're going to start with verse 5 of chapter 11. So I'll give you just a little bit of context. Earlier on in this passage, Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, and it's, uh, it's Luke's version of this. So he's telling the disciples what to pray, but then he kind of transitions into this parable to tell us how we're to pray and really to focus on the one to whom we are praying. So this is what he says in Luke chapter 11, starting with verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go, him, go to him in, at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked, and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And then get verse 11 here. This is great. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, gives him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So in this section, Jesus illustrates through parable a couple of really important things. First of all, we're to know how to pray or petition God. And he uses a phrase in there, shameless audacity. I want to use like Sean Connery's voice or something, that one, shameless audacity. Shameless audacity, what does that even mean? It's it's moxie, it's chutzpah, it's boldness. I wonder how our prayers are when we petition and ask God, are they weak prayers or do we cry out with this chutzpah, this shameless audacity? Daddy, look at me. Look at my condition. Look and see what I'm experiencing. Will you return your favor, light to my eyes? I need you. But Jesus tells us something interesting in this parable because it's not about God's hesitancy in this passage. And it's not even about the intensity of the one that's doing the petitioning. This is really important. This isn't an allegory, right, where the annoyed neighbor is God and and we're the one that's coming to, to him to ask him for things in the night. We can't really read the parable this way. So it's not about God's hesitancy or even the intensity of the petitioner, but it's to remember to whom we are praying and petitioning. God is not a reluctant neighbor. And he's an even better father. A father in heaven who wants to bless us and bless us, as Jesus says in this passage, with his presence. The gift that's to be given in this context is the Holy Spirit. God's presence to us. So even in between the problem and the provision, in, even with that That prayer, we have God's presence and the gift of God's presence. 
So we need to remember that. Why is all of this important? You know, some of us take for granted the reality that we have access to our daddy, to our father. And it's all because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. It's because of his salvific work that we can even approach him and to come to him and say, Daddy, look at me. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says this, Therefore, and when you see a therefore, you need to stop and ask yourself what it's... Right. That's getting old, isn't it, Doug? We do that all the time. Probably shouldn't anymore. Okay, that's the last time. That's the last time we're going to do that. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Look at verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, chutzpah, moxie, shameless audacity, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Petition is God's gift to us in between our problem and our provision, and Jesus makes that access to God the Father a reality for us. So we can say, Daddy, look at me. Look at me, Daddy. So a couple of closing action steps here for us, okay? We've got to do something with this this morning. Number one, I encourage you to mind the depth and beauty of a God who laments and suffers with us. I don't know if you can read that on the screen. Hopefully you can. Mind the depth and beauty of a God who laments and suffers with us. Jesus gives us expression of what it looks like to lament, either through his own lamentations or through the laments that he quotes from Scripture itself. But a God who suffers with us. A God who at one point in his life, in one of the darkest moments of his life, cried out, Father, take this cup. Number two, identify your current area of weaknesses. Remember that Jesus suffered too. Jesus was the God-man, fully God, fully man, perfect in every way, yet he experienced imperfection and hurt of the world, and yet it didn't taint him, didn't touch him in that way. Pray boldly, intensely, with shameless audacity. I want you to say it like that too when you think about it. With moxie, chutzpah. It might be crying out, Daddy, look at me. Look at me, Daddy. Please, please, Daddy, look at me. Remember the God to whom you were addressing in prayer. He is Lord. He is God. He is holy, but He's imminent. He's present. He's here. He gives us the gift of His presence in the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, surrender to his will in prayer, especially in the in-between time. In between the problem and the provision, in that time, church, we need to surrender to his will. It may feel at times God has turned his eye away and taken his favor from us, but he's there. He's present. We need to be encouraged to cry out to him. Petition is God's gift to us in between our problem in our provision. Let's pray. Jesus, Father God, Holy Spirit, God the Son, we need you to look at us. Lord, there's things in our life, there's hurt, there's pain, there's disappointment, there's trial, there's tragedy. Lord, we thank you that we have the expression to be able to talk to you honestly and confidently because of what Jesus has done on the cross, and Lord, that we can approach you as our daddy. So Lord, I pray for my friends, I pray for our community. There are some of us in this room that just say, Lord, Daddy, Father, Abba, look at me. God, no matter what we're going through this morning, would you return your favor to us? Would you return that light in our eyes? Maybe it's been years of deep, dark depression or hurt or pain or disappointment or loss, but restore the joy of our salvation. Look at us, we pray. 
And God, we pray it would not just be for our own purposes, our own good, but as you restore us, would you return that joy in our lives, the hope to which we profess. And God, we pray that not only would you use the hurt and pain in our lives for others' benefits, but you would use that hope and joy that we have in you for the people around us. We love you and we pray this in your holy and powerful name. Amen.